Hi, this is Sal Abascado from A Pale Horse Named Death, and I'm blowing it up on Capital Chaos TV. Um, I, I have like three acres. I live in the country. It's beautiful, but it is freezing, and I can't do anything outside, and I can't mess with my cars or anything. Everything's on lockdown over here. <laughs> I'm familiar with Brooklyn. Brooklyn has. I thought that Brooklyn was in the in the city. You're not. Um, you're not. I don't live Brooklyn. in Brooklyn anymore. Oh, uh, I left. I left the city a long time ago. I've been up here for about eight years. I live in Orange County, New York. Uh, oh wow! Basically, I'm a. Yeah, I'm in upstate, you know, so, but I, I, the New York, Orange County, though, not the Cali. And, uh, you know, we got black bears, coyotes, turkeys, all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, deer right outside my door, you know, all kinds of animals, which is how I like it. And I have not many uh, neighbors up my butt like the city, you know. I, I'm not a fan of L.A., but I like the surrounding, uh, the, 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 the picturesque scenery of the surrounding suburbs and cities, you know, and when you go north, it's so beautiful. So just not a fan of the L.A. craziness. <laughs> the Emerald Triangle. Are you a, a fan of the... Uh the, the I, I was, I, uh, yeah, you know, I, I've been in high times before. I mean, these days I don't uh, really partake as, as much. I had to quit smoking for a number of reasons. Uh, I used to be a heavy cigarette smoker, too. Uh, so uh, once in a while, I reckon, but I used to be a daily kind of guy on tour. You know, I used to forget about it. Uh, I used to require uh, tour managers to, like, get me, you know, ounces before I even started the tour. So, yeah, I'm all for it, though, and I... I, I love. I have friends. I have. I have grower friends that are out in uh, Oregon, and I have a friend that actually is out there in California as well. That's why I know people. I definitely do. It, it, it's too much. It's too much for the mind after a while when you get older. It depends. It really does. It depends. This yeah, stuff is so strong now. Anyway, this is uh, Zora Leodorovic with Capital Chaos TV, and we have Sal from a pale horse named Death on the phone. Uh, how are you doing, Sal? I'm doing very good. I'm enjoying all the attention that uh, we're getting with the new record, and I'm enjoying talking to nice folks like yourself about the record. And, uh, you know, I can't complain. It's been a really good week this week. And uh, you're currently home uh, in Orange County, New York, where it's 15 degrees. Is that correct? Yeah, it's very cold and very gusty. I feel like I'm in, like, the Antarctica or something right now. It's crazy. And does it uh, get uh, crazy hot in the summertime, too? Yeah, that's the problem. You know, it gets really hot, but you have, like, that humid hot, not a dry heat, you know, and the humidity is really, it really gets gets annoying, and it makes everything uncomfortable. So I'm not a fan of the New York weather. Uh, I keep on moaning to my wife that I want to, you know, one day move out to, you know, I don't know, Texas or Sedona, you know, so... Maybe one day when we're older, I can't see myself being retired in my old age dealing with this kind of cold than dealing with snow. It's just too much. Maybe uh, someplace like Costa Rica. No, I'm not a fan of Costa Rica. <laughs> I'm more like, I'm down with like, I like Sedona, Arizona. Uh, well, maybe someplace like, you know, suburbs of like somewhere in Texas or, I don't know, you know. Uh, I would consider, uh, California is really expensive. I don't know if I, I, I would get as much as I want for the money out there, but uh, I'm a big fan of Sedona, actually. I like mountains and colorful rocks. <laughs> That sounds like Sedona. Now, uh, how did you first get into music, and who turned you on to rock and roll and heavy metal? Uh, that started when I was like ten years old. I was at I was like I was at sleepaway camp, and 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 and, and these older kids they were blasting. <laughs> You know, Blast and Never Say Die by Black Sabbath, and uh, that record had just recently come out, and then, like, that same summer of, it was 1980, Blizzard of Oz came out, and I got totally attracted to that whole sound, and then I just, I mean, my parents thought I was, like, worshiping the devil or something, but, uh, you know, I was, I came home, and I was like, I gotta get these records, and, and, and I started buying, like, the whole Sabbath catalog, and then following Ozzy on the, on, on when the first two records came out, and, uh, uh, then, you know, Iron Maiden, 
uh, I liked a little bit of Priest, but I wasn't so crazy about them. Uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, that's kind of how it started. By 11, I, I was begging so much by 11, they bought me my first drum set. And so I started playing, you know, drums like a little kid making a racket. By the time I was 13, I did my first concert performance at my high, junior high school. And I was... I was hooked at, hooked ever since, and uh, one thing came happened after another. Literally in 1986, uh, put out our first independent thrash record with a band called Toxemia, and then a few years later, uh, you know, I was very tight. I mean, at the age of 13, I was already hanging out with Peter because I was taking drum lessons from uh, the drummer of Carnivore, and uh, his name was Louis Diotto, and he was taking me to rehearsal. So I was big into carnival and all of that stuff. And when they broke up, I was when I kind of made the moves on uh, saying, hey, you know, you want to start jamming? I went to Peter's house, asked me if he wanted to jam and get together, and that was kind of summer of 89, how Typo Negative kind of started coming to fruition. Um, so that's kind of a, a real quick lumped up story about my teenage years and how I got into music and got addicted to music and performing live. Uh, and that's where it all started. And, and kind of when I started working with Peter, that's when I went out and bought like a bass and a guitar. And I started teaching myself, learning how to play guitar just by hanging around with Peter all the time and watching how he did things and how he wrote. And I just started absorbing things since then. And that's how it all started. But it was because of that fateful summer in 1980, I went to sleepaway camp. And I got exposed to some good stuff. Even like uh, Foreigner, Jukebox Hero was a big song around that time. And, and, and stuff like that. Led Zeppelin IV uh, was was a big deal too for me. And Rush, Moving Pitches came out not long after that. So it's a kind of a handful of the records that started grabbing my ear and turning me into like a heavy metal rock and roll guy. At uh, what point did you uh, uh, think about possibly being a, a front man? Ooh, you know, I was always like one of those like bathroom type of in the shower type of guys that thought, you know, would sing in the shower a little bit. But uh, finally, in, in, in when I came up with the concept of a pale horse named Death in 2009, I wanted to do something where I was writing everything and orchestrating everything, and I wanted to challenge myself, and I wanted to express and see what kind of, what was going, what was coming out of me. At the same time, I started writing lyrics and melodies were coming to me and I started singing in like this kind of, I don't know, a little bit more of a baritone-ish type of voice and I was intending it just to be like a studio thing. I never intended, I didn't even know it was going to come out, you know, it was just something I was doing for myself and uh, also as everybody knows, any band or musician knows how difficult it is to find singers. Um, I had linked up with a friend of mine named Matt Brown who was in the band after that and we did the recording together and he thought I was doing a pretty good job as a new amateur singer. Uh, and then one thing led to another. Um, SPV heard the, the, the first demo versions of what we were doing and they wanted to sign the band. And I was like, holy cow, I had no idea to get signed with this. And then an agent friend of mine was like, hey, you, you want to play in, you want to open up a show with, with Monster Magnet in New Jersey at the Starland Ballroom? And I was like, really? And then I had to scramble and put a band together. And, 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 and I, was, I was really nervous. And it was the first time I had to go up in front of everybody. And it was a packed house because it was Monster Magnet. And I was really nervous and shy to get up there and sing these songs that I had just recorded and written. And uh, they kind of started from there. And then they threw me into a tour that summer. And I was getting pretty much, you know, training of singing every day on a tour. And then by the time the second record came, I was a lot more com confident. And so I did my performance on that record better. And then after that record, I went on some really big tours, like with Danzig, and we did some really long tours in Europe. And then we, you know, we were playing festivals in Europe in front of thousands of people. So here I am getting in front of thousands of people where, as a drummer, it's easy. You're in the back, you get to hide a little bit behind the cymbals, you know, you hide a little bit behind the drums if you want. But as a front person, you're like right there where anyone can like hit you off the head with a cigarette butt. And uh, it was it was definitely a, a, a transformation. But then I, I started feeling really comfortable because I started really enjoying teasing the audience and joking around and just being myself. And I realized if I'm just myself and I wear my heart on my sleeve and I just belt it out, 
it's going to all be okay. And I just got better and better at it where now it's just like second nature to go up there and just BS with the crowd and just do what I got to do. And Hey, if you don't like it, that's fine too. I don't expect everyone to like it, but a lot of people liked it and were like, cool. And then all of a sudden there's these reviews on the earlier records. People come making these comparisons to Manson and Lane Staley, which are like the biggest compliments in the world for me. And, um, and that's kind of like a long story short, how I kind of built the confidence to do it. And, uh, the new album comes out, uh, is it next Friday? Yeah. The 18th It's coming out Friday. It's a big day. We're doing a lot of stuff. Revolver magazine is involved. We're doing a tattoo contest. We're, we're playing a show in New York city, uh, at the Mercury lounge as our record release party uh so after a five almost for a five-year hiatus because i was involved in other bands um it's 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 finally coming out you must be you're very excited how excited are you you know i i am i'm like a little kid right now you know i'm i'm, I'm I've been doing this for a long time, and um, I, what, what was getting me was when, it, when the band was deactivated for a little while because I was busy, you know, I was getting letters from fans saying, dude, I love your band so much, you know, what are you doing? You need to make another APH and B album. Um, and, I, and I was working on it. I already had a lot of sketches and the concept and the title I had since 2014. I mean, this has been in the works for a long time as far as the concept and the the pieces of material. Uh, I'm really excited because life is short and I'm trying, I see it now. I'm a father of three girls and I see how everyone around me is aging. Life is short. I felt it was important like, to continue the story that I started and I'm hoping to be able to do a few more records and continue this legacy of all the work I've done in my life and um, you know, leave my family with something to be proud of that, you know, dad did all these cool things back in the day. Uh, so I am excited and I'm really excited about the response because, you know, when you write an album and put your heart and soul into it, you, you just, it's really crushing when people like don't like it or are talking bad things about it. You know, it's really heartbreaking. And it hurts you because people really put a lot into their music. You know, it, it is a very emotional journey for a songwriter. So I'm really happy the response has been so great. Uh, interviews have been so great. Everyone's been so sweet about it. So I am excited. I, I feel like I've been reborn, especially this week, because I was very, I was, I was, I was depressed even up to a few weeks ago. I just didn't know what was going to happen. And then we started like hiring and firing a bunch of agents. And now things are turning around. And sometimes when you're with people that are, don't really put you in their priorities, you get left on off, kicked to the curb for, you know. So I think things are really turning around now, and I'm really excited. And I like hearing the people's responses to the music. It's easy to say, well, I don't really care what they think. As long as I'm happy, that's all that matters. But the reality is we all do, to some degree, care what other people think. Unless Absolutely. Unless we're just like some, you know. Well, you know, there is vanity. Vanity is definitely part of this business. So uh, this is why people are so addicted to social media. They want to know how many likes they get for some idea or picture that they put up. So uh, society is very vain also. So... Of course people care what people think. People care what people think when they walk out the door to go to work and how they look. Uh, you know, so, yeah, I, I do care to the point where I like getting a good feedback from people and knowing that I've uh, done uh, something cool for them to listen to and that they enjoy it and maybe it helps them in their life. The world uh, becoming undone. When the world becomes undone, is the, is the world becoming undone? Or has it been undone? Well, you know, this concept and the title began in 2014, and it was based, it started because I was in a hotel in Europe, I was watching my unfiltered news, and I was seeing all the crazy stuff that was already going on, and the world's been crazy, and mankind has been crazy for eons. The thing that cracks me up is that, man, we all keep on repeating history. No one's learning anything after thousands of years. And then, of course, in the last five years, things have gone progressively worse. Then you fell into into the whole cauldron, this insane political frenzy, which I do not like to comment or speak about politics, but there's this crazy political civil war, it seems like, that's going on between 
people and and politicians and it's just like no one's focusing at what's really important and what's really important is the citizens and the well-being the well-being health and prosperity of the citizens of the United States and it's the citizens of the United States that need to be protected it's the citizens of the United States that need to be thought about you know also and so i think i think there's this there's this thing going on that our forefathers would be rolling over in their graves for what they fought for and 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 i think i think things are kind of are crazy they're crazy and literally you have to literally watch out what you say cuz it seems like there is no longer freedom of speech there is no longer free will people cannot remain friends and agree to disagree this is what's sad okay look look no one you, the whole world can't be on the same page okay your favorite color might be black or red and my favorite color might be yellow or green just cuz we don't like the same color doesn't mean we have to be mean or nasty to each other we just like different colors okay man that's cool you wear a green shirt i'll wear a black shirt no problem brother you know that's how it's I, you know, I think it's just out of control, and I think everyone's at fault. And it just, I, like I said, I don't, want, I don't talk politics because I don't want anyone branding me with any kind of nonsense. But I think it's a shame that people can't come together and have a cohesive plan for the well-being of this country, because people should care about this country first, and I don't care about everybody else. Because look, Switzerland don't give a, a, a hoot about anybody. Look how they do. They do just fine. Okay? Scandinavia. You know, there's countries that mind their own business and they're doing fine. This whole idea of saving the world and being the police of the world and getting involved in every little stupid thing is ridiculous. People have been fighting since 10,000 years ago and it will continue to fight. We come from the tribal ancestry, you know, uh, uh, we come from the days of throwing spears and fighting over land and it'll always be like that on some form or another. It's just human nature. Right. If we're not going to be fighting over religion, we'll be we'll be killing each other over sports teams. There's always going to crazy. be something. We'll always find something uh, to divide us, or somebody yes. will somebody will find something to divide us um, at their profit, or yeah, or whatever. There's always going to be some some sort of thing, you know. Ball always some people, shit, dude. Skinheads versus long hairs, or uh, yeah. Hey, when I was a kid in Brooklyn, when I was a kid in Brooklyn in 1983, they used to be like the disco kids would like stop their cars and run out and beat up a kid for wearing a, an Aussie shirt with long hair. Happened to me once. You know, that's, you know, it, 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 things like that have been happening, but it's a shame that just people can't be. You know, people should let people be, and no genre or gender should be force feeding their shit onto people if people don't agree. You gotta learn to let it be, man. Like the song said, just let it be. If that dude wants to wear a polka dot dress, okay, fine. But don't bother me because I want to ride my Harley with loud pipes down the street too. You know what I'm saying? It's just like it's fine. You want your freedom? You got it. Don't force it and in and force every household in the country to be okay with it. Okay, because everyone has a right to do it, be where they want to be in life. You don't have to, you know, it could be, okay. you know, that's the, that's the problem. That's the problem with now. They're forcing you. And if you don't agree, the mob descends upon you and your name is destroyed or your career is destroyed because you didn't agree with a certain group. Oh, this is the first Black Sabbath record. Um, Sergeant Peppers by the Beatles. Uh, Led Zeppelin one and Jimi Hendrix experience. Uh, those kind of records are like a heavy influence in my mind um, for me. And as far as new bands, I don't. I live under a rock. I don't like to listen to new bands, but I did recently, two years ago, get into a band that I love called Windhand, which is like a super doomy cool band from Virginia. I think they're from. So it's, uh, it's really kind of it in a nutshell. I don't. I. Um, but those early records are what heavily influenced my life and my musical direction.